Hello and welcome to another episode of the programme. This week we're on Clear Island, where we'll be finding out more about what it has to offer and learn more about the iconic sites, including Brawny Wales Castle. I'm on my way from Moonapier on Clear Island Ferries and I'm about to meet the skipper, Carol O'Grady. The O'Grady's have been running the ferry in and out to Clare Island for up on 150 years now and uh, my great great grandfather ran it in times when they had old yawls to Currocks and my dad in the mid 50s uh, bought the first motorboat to Clare Island and uh, this is one of them over here at the Dolphin and uh, from then on he's progressed and we've uh, up to today where we have 96 passenger all weather class uh, vessels. Uh, operating to the island, yeah. And how often do you come in and out to the island? The ferry um, operates uh, all through the year, twice a day, uh, when weather permits, and in the summertime we have uh, up to six sailings a day. In 2012 I uh, took the uh, old Bayview Hotel, which my father set up in 1964, and I converted it into Go Explore Hostel, Sailors Bar and Restaurant and we've been operating very successfully since then. We specialise in local seafood and live entertainment at weekends uh, throughout uh, the season, which runs from the beginning of May till the end of September, and we take groups in all uh, through the year in the winter when weather permits, uh, specialised groups. And uh, yeah, we employ locally. We have a great chef, Dermot Murphy from uh, Ballina, a great barman, a great head barman from Clare Island. We, you know, great staff and uh, that give across the message uh, you know, that Clare Island is open for business. You're very entrepreneurial, uh, but what I would say is with Carpers, your latest venture, you got into the whiskey business. Yeah, well, we've uh, set up uh, Clare Island Whiskey Matured at Sea, uh, which took uh, my father's uh, first boat that he built in 19, well, uh, second boat he built in 1964, which was built by the O'Malley's down in Curran. And uh, we've converted, we rescued her first because she was sunk above in Ballina after we sold her, she was neglected and we, we got her back and we restored her and we brought uh, uh, John O'Malley up uh, from Curran to help bring her back to life. He's the man that built her. Uh, came out of retirement specially for it and uh, now we've put a cask of whiskey on our cask of new make spirit on board where it's going to remain on board for three years. It's already on a year. We have another cask going on this summer. Uh, we're working on the branding, the packaging at the moment and please God we'll be ready ready to go to market in two more years with the first release of Clare Island Whiskey Matured at Sea. It's never been done before in Europe, it's the first time and uh, it's going to offer something very unique and very special and we're very excited about it. Well we wish you well with it and continued success. Thank you very much. Corey, you've recently taken up uh, the job as development officer here on Clare Island. That's right, I just took up the role at the end of last year. And what attracted you to it? Well, I've been living here for the last five years. I'm originally from Kinsale in County Cork, and I've been working in tourism and different projects on the island during that time. So the job came up and I decided to apply for it, and here I am now. And you've hit the ground running because there's a lot of things happening on Clear Island. Oh, I'll tell you, it's, it's non-stop out here. Um, people are amazed, really, because we're quite a small island, uh, size-wise and population. We have about 160 people year-round. And then uh, size-wise, we're about eight kilometres by five kilometres wide. But we have a whole calendar of events that we run throughout the summer season. And that's a big part of my job, is helping the local groups organise, plan and, and run events. Of course, that's just uh, one part of it. That's looking at the kind of uh, the tourism and summer season. We have a very long winter out here as well. And we're working on all sorts of projects to try and make life better for people uh, living out here, you know. And one of your latest projects here, of course, is a play school here on the island. Yeah, actually, we have um, a, a playground, community playground, actually, that we are just started building there a couple of weeks ago. So we were delighted when we got all the funding for that. And um, we hope to have it opened in the next month. The children are very excited. I remember uh, I was at the school explaining to the kids about um, all the different play areas and things that they would have. And one of the kids asked me, uh, Miss, will we, will we have a sandbox? And I said, I'll tell you, we will. 
I said, and it's across the road, it's the beach that you can see here behind you. you know? yeah, because there's quite a young population on the island. We have a very young population. It's a living island. It's a bright future for Clare Island. We have about 23 youngsters now at the primary school. Of course, we only have a primary school out here. We don't have any secondary school. So uh, that's one of the, the realities of island living is that all the children, when it comes to second level, they have to travel out to the mainland on a Monday morning on the early boat and they, they lodge in houses out there for the rest of the week and they make it back in on a Friday. Now that's brilliant in the summer or spring, autumn. Sometimes in the winter it can be you know difficult because the boats don't go and kids are stuck on the mainland, families are separated but you know there's the, the good things and the bad things about living out here and, and you know Islanders just get on with it. The uh, ferry coming out this morning was absolutely packed with Grady's uh, ferry, Clare Island ferries. Um, so what, can, what do people do when they come out here visiting? Oh, this is a paradise for outdoor activity. I mean, when you get this weather, it really is amazing, as you'll see today on the show. Um, there's walking, there's swimming at the beach, there's kayaking, there's hiking. We get a lot of groups actually travel from overseas to come hike here because it's a very confined space. You know, you're not going to get lost, lost out in the hills, in a sense. But we're kind of a unique Irish island as well, in the sense that we are one of the highest islands. We have um, our, our highest point is about 450 metres high, um, Knockmore, or the Big Hill, as everyone calls it here. And we get a lot of French groups, German groups, Italians, and of course Irish and English groups as well, that come specifically just for the walking and the hiking. But walks to suit all levels. We have, um, like, that would be more challenging. But we have a beautiful one hour stroll that you can take up to our lighthouse that was, I think, built originally in 1806. And then, of course, if you're more into relaxing, we have beautiful seafood available for a day trip out, lunch, and glass of wine, whatever. Um, in my job in the community development and, and the development office, we're working on plans all the time. Uh, community Futures is, is a project we're involved in where we look at um, consultation with the community and, and putting together a five-year plan, the desires of the people here, what they want, and we work towards achieving those dreams. And that's exactly how the playground came about because uh, surveys were handed out and people responded and uh, once we have that information in the office you know we can make things happen then. Well we wish you well and continued success. Thank you so much. Along my travels on the island I was told about the Ballytoomey looms, a must-stop experience. Beth when did you set up this craft business? I set up the business over 30 years ago and uh, I did it because we had a farm full of wool that needed to be spun and I needed a job. So uh, it's been going ever since. And how did you learn to do all this craft, uh, spinning and yarning? And Well, I learned the craft uh, pretty much experientially. I learned it by doing it. I had a, a woman from Westport who came and taught for one week the weaving and the setting up of the looms. And besides that, everything I've learned has been Sounds of my good. own initiative. Yeah. Well, uh, you came home from America. This uh, actually building we're in, it's uh, six generations of the same family, isn't it? That's true. It's kind of rare on the island because things, people got moved around a lot at the time of the Land Commission and six generations in this house of Mourns. Yeah. So what do you make here then, Beth? So I have, uh, as I said, a farm full of sheep and I spin the wool and I make carpets from that. As well as that, I've, I, I do a lot of very fine thread work, so I use silks and other natural uh, fibres. So I make fabrics, scarves, clothing, carpets. We're adding new things to our repertoire every year. And you have a showroom here for people come to the island to come and visit to your showroom? Yes, we have a, a little workshop and showroom, so people can come in and see the work in progress. and. You can come and do courses here, so you could actually come and learn how to do the spinning and the weaving. And of course, you can always do a bit of retail therapy in the shop area. <laughs> and, and the courses, do the, are the week-long course or, or weekend courses? or? We do our courses on weekends, week long, and this year we've started mini courses, so people coming in for the day can do two-hour courses and go away with a little piece of weaving for themselves. And what's the most popular course then? 
Well, I'd say the week-long one is probably the most popular because you get a lot into that. So they learn a bit of everything? Everything. Okay. Mm -hmm. And do you export any of your products? We did a lot of export at one time, uh, but we pretty much keep to ourselves now. And our export market is done through shows. We sell direct because it's very difficult to do shops in the type of work that we do very individual. And what's the most popular type of product that you have here for the market? I'd say one of the most popular things that we do are the carpets because they're very special, the homespun ones. No one is really doing them anymore. They're a very nice presentation piece. They're very much all about Clare yeah. Island. You know, so if you want to get a very special Clare Island piece, that is the piece to get. And how long would it take you to make one of them. And I just finished a commission of a rug which was very long and it took me two months to actually spin the wool and it took me two weeks to weave it. So, ten weeks. Well, and if people want to see some of this wonderful uh, craft that you do here, uh, do you have a website? I do have a website, yeah, and you can find all your information on that about our courses and about what we do and how we've been doing it for the last 30 years. Well, so obviously business must be good when you're at it that long. Do you know what it is? <laughs> it's not really a living, but a way of life. And that's how I describe it. And it's a very, very good way of life. Well, I hope you never change it, Beth. Well done. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Henry. Well, that brings us to the end of part one. Don't go away. We've lots more to come in part two. So we'll see you in a couple of minutes. Fulton Rash, you're very welcome to part two of the programme. Well, I'm off to meet Roy McCann from the Lighthouse here on Clear Island. Roy, this is a very unique property we're in. Well, that's for sure. It's the only lighthouse in Ireland where you get fed. You can have your bed, breakfast and dinner. All the other lighthouses are self-catering. But we are part of the Great Lighthouses of Ireland initiative. And there's 12 lighthouses, like a necklace around Ireland. Mm -hmm. Now, you're the furthest point on Clare Island as well. We are, yeah. We're the furthest point north of Clare Island, about six kilometres from the quay. And I think the island is about 10 or 12 kilometres wide. So it's a nice little trek to get here. Mm -hmm. and, and for guests who want to stay here, what, what's available for them? Well, as regards staying, it's just bed, breakfast and dinner. But most people come here just to get away from, from their everyday life and from the daily grind. So, but we get all sorts of uh, different types of people here. And initially my friends said, oh, Ro, you won't get any Irish people staying here. But in fact, most of our clientele are Irish. Mm. And I'd say after that it's American and we get a good mixture of Continentals, French, Italian and Spanish. And, and how many can you cater for? We can cater for 10 people. We have five bedrooms, five double bedrooms, so it's fairly small and everybody eats together. We have communal dining, which is very interesting and people seem to really enjoy it. And is it all your own business? No, um, we really are from the 1st of May until the end of September. We tried operating from March until October and even into December, but it's much too stressful for everybody concerned because of the weather and we're never sure about the boats. So it really is a summertime sort of destination. And your own role here as well? Um, well, I suppose I'm the general manager. Um, I, I set it up with Gusta Fisher and we opened in June 2013 after spending a year doing the interiors. Gusta is the owner, Gusta Fisher is the owner and he started the renovations in 2008 and he spent four years doing the fabric of the building from the roof to the flooring etc. And then it, spent, it took us a year to do the interiors. And of course one of the great features of the lighthouse here is the uh, tower. Yeah, well, as you notice as well, there's actually two towers at Tyrone Lighthouse. The first tower that was built in 1860, it actually was burnt down in 1813. Somebody um, threw a lighthouse wick into a bucket of oil, and that's one of our bedrooms. It's called the Tower House. And then the Lantern House, the newer tower, was built in um, about 1813, and it was in existence until it was decommissioned in 1965. And then it was replaced by the little lighthouse over in Ackleberg, and it's a working lighthouse. 
Now, if people, uh, and of course there's so many activities to do when they're staying here as well. Mm. Well, on Clear Island, mm. there's a lot of very, very good walking for all different levels, from kind of mm. coastal walks to sort of mountain walks, and there's cycling, and of course then you have the uh, community centre and the sailors bar for lunch. We don't provide lunch here, so I think it's very important and very good for the people to get out and about and walk around the place and meet all the Clare Island people. And if people want more information about uh, the lighthouse here, you have your own? Website. Well, I have a website www.clareislandlighthouse.com or they can give me a call on 003538767589758. And is business good at present? Well, we're at the moment running at 95% occupancy. So um, it took us six years to become an overnight success. <laughs> <laughs> well, well done, Warrior, and we wish you continued success. Thank you very that. much, Henry. Yeah. Thank you. Kira, what is or who is McCullough Farm? Who is McCullough Farm? So we are, um, we're a farm, so we are growing um, a lot of, um, we're basically growing all the vegetables that we consume, not just our family, our kind of larger family, which includes volunteers from all over the world that come and help us. Um, and also we run residential courses and retreats, um, with yoga, um, mindfulness, horses, vegetarian cooking. So the farm aspect is of the, the growing of the food. And um, the people that come and help us have a lot of opportunity to learn how to do this. Um, I suppose you would say kind of living sustainably um, under the very uniquely um, conditions of an island off the West Coast. And does that make it more difficult or easy living on an island to grow vegetables? Well, difficult, you know. I mean, like now we have glorious weather, but but yeah, difficult in the sense of the conditions, the soils, the wind, you know, all those things. So um, we also have, we have horses, which we work with naturally. We include, we were running a course at the moment, which is including horses um, with the yoga and the mindfulness. Um, we have milking sheep, we have ducks. So, you know, we could say that the farm is definitely um, uh, an exploration of how to live sustainably and then the courses the residential retreats that we run throughout the year are um, exploring yoga meditation mindfulness and we get people coming from all over the world and different and, backgrounds. And how is it going for you generally here? No it's it's I, it's going well I mean I think the island for people to it's an adventure to come out to an island and it's something about leaving behind your you know, your burdens, your worries, your ordinary life, um, kind of when you get on the boat at Runa. Um, and so that the island definitely provides a very interesting setting for doing the sort of things that we do. Now you have another project just about to come on stream, you're opening a nice little cafe. Yes, and that that has been um, a work in progress over the years and because what the, we're very passionate about food um, and uh, food that is very you know, extremely local because it's grown here, seasonal because we only use what we grow. And it's only been with the um, people on our courses. So the idea of this little cafe is that we are going to bring this out more into the public domain. And it, there's a stone barn um, that we've been renovating over the years and it's just by the side of the road. So hopefully we'll have that up and running soon. And how many people can you cater for for these courses? Um, we would normally take about, maximum is around 14. So they're small. Um, but we provide the accommodation and uh, and then the whole program of, of events. And what will be the duration about the week? Um, these people or? here are at the moment are here for five nights. Um, we have courses coming up soon that will be six nights, seven nights, and then we also do shorter three night courses or weekend courses. And if people want more information about all of these activities here at McCullough Farm, yes. how, how do they go about it? On our website, which is uh, McCulloughFarm.ie. Simple as that. Simple as that. We have a fairly cool this weekend, which is Friday, Saturday and Sunday night music. And during the day we have workshops, music all around, different people come from the mainland. Um, they're doing workshops in dancing, music, singing, playing instruments, all that. And tomorrow we have Arcadia, which will be uh, a group coming up from Newport and we're all going dancing. Well, 
And uh, traditional music is alive and well here on the island. It is, yeah. There is the National School of Age play music and they have music I think every week or every second week on a Friday where they all come together and play and sometimes on the weekends they gather. And every Tuesday night in July and August here on the island we have a, it's called the Kyoto's Tuesday night session, we call it. And that's when anyone local or far away comes and they enjoy the night, maybe a few drinks, and they have, they play music, they sing songs, tell stories, jokes, whatever they like. You have a great location here, right at the bay, don't you? The it is, yeah, we're looking out onto the bay there, really. We're so lucky with what we've got. We, you don't appreciate it until it's gone, but until you're away and you don't see what you've got, and it's great. Uh, so what else goes on here in the community centre? Well, it's very busy. Um, any functions that anyone wants to book, that happens. We had a few weddings, and um, a few concerts throughout the years. Um, we also have sports down in the hall. That's a very big sports centre. And then there's the pub down here below and all the profits go back into community again and it's uh, very busy all throughout the year. Any courses or anything that wants to, private functions, people can just organise them and have them in the hall of meetings. And a lot of visitors coming to the island? Yes, we have many visitors all from across the world, a lot of American tourists, Spanish, German, European, all sorts come from all shapes and sizes. And you recently had a big cruise ship. Uh... We did, yeah, that was um, an amazing event, hopefully it'll happen every year. The cruise ship landed, just a dot outside the island and they came on their own separate ribs to the pier and then we, they all came up to the sailors bar, the hotel we used to call it and um, there was lovely, we had some dancing and music and singing up there and there was lovely food and I suppose an exchange of their experiences and our island experiences and songs and dancing. So they had a great time. Oh, they did, yeah. One does when they come to Clear Island. Yes, and hopefully it'll be an annual event. I'm a man that likes a quiet life with an odd wee bit of crack. I live with my daughter's family in the wee room round the back. They all moved in when the missus died. They said they'd keep me right, but the only thing they're good for is converting spuds to. <laughs> now, the eldest girl is a tight wee blade. She never missed a trick. With a temper like a nest of wasps, you were poking with a stick. Every stitch that she put on had to be the height of fashion, specifically designed, it seems, to raise a young man's passion. But when she went away to Queens, her head began to swell, and then she got a boyfriend, and things really went to hell. She was lucky that astronomy was not her chosen class, because she had the clear impression that the sun shone from his earth. The, his suits were by Armani, and his shirts were silk and fine. His drawer, his shirts were all Italian, and his drawers were Calvin Klein.